I'm really thankful for Pastor Bruce and Pastor Jr. for uh, holding down the fort and then bringing a wonderful word. And I'm sure they're extremely thankful that they don't have to deal with the text that I've been assigned today, because it's a fun one, folks. It's a fun one. And so they have done a really wonderful job at setting up one of the most controversial chapters in the entire Bible. If you have not gathered that already in your personal study or personal reflection as you go through Romans chapter 7, you soon will be faced with a lot of conflicting messages, conflicting ideas, conflicting questions, conflicting thoughts, and that's okay. How many of you know that that's okay? that it's hard sometimes, right? How many of you know that some of our greatest strength comes from tension? So we, were, we really will be jumping into uh, a, a very tense kind of um, message today in uh, Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 14. My assignment today is 14 through 20, but I think it would be fitting for us to look at 14 through 25. And um, over the next... Two weeks we'll be exploring this. Really, two weeks is not enough. I probably need about 10 weeks to really deal with this section um, because there's just a lot going on here. Now, how many of you have uh, been in small group? You've read this text. You've read a Devo. How many of you have been in it? In it? So some of you, not all of you. How many of you have not been in it? All right, that's okay. It's okay, too. Um, well, we're about to get in it. And um, although some of you might have had opportunity to think through some of this, um, you won't be left behind if you haven't. I'm going to do my best to really lay the groundwork and, and pose maybe three arguments or three positions that people hold regarding this text. Specifically, let me just say this, specifically coming out of Romans 6, let me do a brief summary, where in Romans 6 we see that we are set free from the power of sin right? In our life, we, we are dead now to sin, right? And we are, we are united in Jesus' death, that we might also be united in his resurrection, that we no longer are slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness, that he has transformed us. He has made us a new creation. What we used to be slaves to, we are no longer slaves to. And I'm talking about the type of slavery that no matter what you want to do, you can't do because something has rulership over you. That's what sin did. So praise God, through belief and faith in Christ, we are set free from that sin. And now we are slaves to Christ. Specifically, slaves to righteousness. That's Romans 6. So we have been encouraged. We We have been challenged a little bit. We have taken inventory of our life, and we've looked at our life, and we've asked questions like, does this look like me? If this is what a saved life looks like, a redeemed life looks like, do I look like that? Has this transformation taken effect in my life? Do I see these changes Am I a slave to sin or am I a slave to God? We've asked some challenging questions, haven't we? We've reflected. Some of you have questioned and asked me questions and your parents' questions and friends' questions and people in your small group, the type of question of, I'm trying to decide if I'm saved or not. And that's okay because all the apostles were very comfortable in their writing in the New Testament of making you come to a place where you question, where you test, where you wonder. Because it is in questioning that we can come out with an answer. Where no questions are, no answers can be formed. It is questions that help us arrive at a destination, a belief system, and a position. So it has been good that we've done even that. But also we've been encouraged. Because we see that although sin seems to be multiplying in the world, we rejoice because just as sin seems to multiply and have exponential increase, so will righteousness for all who are saved. And as we are saved and because we are saved, righteousness then will increase in our life an exponential rate that now we will be sanctified more and more day by day until we are fully and completely delivered, even from the presence of sin, one day when we stand in heaven are given a new body. 
right? Completely delivered. So sanctified day by day, righteousness growing and increasing day by day, us becoming more like him day by day, and one day being completely released from any residue of sin that might remain in our flesh man. Isn't that good? So that's, our, that's chapter 6. Then we turn to chapter 7. And he begins, listen, where you can go wrong here is if you want, if you want chapter 7 to say what chapter 6 is saying. Chapter 7 doesn't have to say what chapter 6 is saying. He's saying something different in chapter 7. So that's the first thing. Our job is to figure out what the author is saying in chapter 7 and what he was saying in chapter 6. All right? And then we, once we determine that, then we can begin to understand where the author is taking us. Right? Let's read it together. Romans 7. Let's do some work and let's figure out what is he saying? Because it almost seems like in chapter 7, specifically what I'm talking about now, think about what we've learned in chapter 6. We're not a slave to sin. Slave doesn't reign anymore. You're set free. He's going to sanctify you. You're made holy. You're, you're delivered. Right? Now you're a slave to Christ and you're a slave to righteousness. And then we read this. And it just seems like a contradiction. Right? Here we go. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but... I am of the flesh, sold under sin. How many of you that makes you, after chapter 6, go... Verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That That it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. How many of you are like now, at this point already, you're like, wait a minute. Wait wait just one minute, Sean. What about chapter 6? Right? If you've been studying along with us, this should be confusing to you. You should be concerned. And matter of fact, you should have a lot of questions right here. It's good to have questions. Don't be like, uh, don't be like sitting here going, oh, yes, oh, amen, and looking over your neighbor like, they amen it too? Like, I, I got to amen because I don't look like the person who doesn't know what's going on here. Right? No, don't be like that. It's okay to have questions about this. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what's right, but the inability to carry it out. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's my assignment for the day, but let's read on. Verse 21 through 25. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight, listen to this, this is important, I delight in the law of God. How many of you remember Romans 1? How many of you remember what depraved people feel about the law? Keep that in mind, it's important. So here we get a little indication of who he might be talking about here. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. Let me just stop here. You can put it in your notes. I would encourage you to do so. Because really, quite honestly, as we go through this, for there to be some clarity, and I, I really believe breaking down some of this, there are two laws at work I would probably categorize them this way. 
You might be able to dismantle this theologically. I think words are very difficult when we're trying to talk about spiritual things and use earthly words to communicate them. But I'll do my best here. One thing that I see lining up here when we see the conflict between two laws at work in the life of a person... We see these laws that are in conflict with one another taking up residence in one of two places. One law at work is in the mind. That is one law. And then that law, right, is in conflict with the law that takes place in the flesh. So you have here two things. You have the mind and the flesh. Both the mind and the flesh are waging war against one another. Okay, that's the best way I can say it in earthly terms. We see these words used through the entire book of Romans. We see this war raging between the flesh of man and the mind of man. We see this taking place. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. Notice this. I see the law in my members, flesh, body, waging war, conflict, between the law in my what? So that's where the war is taking place. Let me just go ahead and say we have a promise That the broken part of us we receive when we get to heaven is done away with and we receive a new, which is flesh. It is important theologically for us to understand, and I'm sorry, this is teachy, but but like we can't help but not do this right here, right? I mean, I want to get up and give you three points and get you pumped and we'll just go out and you'll be encouraged and you'll go home. But you got to understand what's happening here. Like, this, like Paul is not some hobo off the street talking about stuff. This guy is a scholar. He knows what he's talking about. And if you don't understand what he's saying and the terminology he's using, we're in trouble. And really, quite honestly, if you don't understand everything he said up to this point and begin to put pieces together, you're toast when it comes to Romans, Right? So we know we receive a new body. So we know that because we still have this body, sin still dwells in the members. Or some theologians will say old nature. That there is the old nature is still there, but we have a new nature where a new part of us is in us. And these two things wage war with one another. How many of you could testify to the fact that that is accurate on some level in your life? Uh, Those of you who didn't raise your hand, then I guess you would align with the fact... I'm just picking on you. You would align with the fact that once you became a believer, you never sinned, you never even thought of sinning, you never even looked at anything the wrong way, you never even thought the wrong thing, you never gossiped again, you never even had a problem, you never rolled your eyes, you never thought anything derelict or silly. There was no reprobate way in you, nothing, no remnant of irritation at all. You were a floating deity at the point of salvation. Or could we really testify to the fact that there's a conflict that still rages after he makes us new and releases us from sin which we used to be slave to? I think most of you would agree with that, and that's good, because that will help you in the sermon today. 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Notice here the tension between what he knows to be true and what he feels to be true. Notice the tension. Notice when... Whenever in the world, particularly even in the church, when the enemy wants to attack our worship, notice that he tries to make us slaves to what we feel rather than what we think. Matter of fact, today in the church there's a movement that the greatest worship is when we turn our brain off and we turn our body on. Because that's how the enemy attacks our worship. Because when we 
worship at the altar of how we feel. We don't worship God. We worship us. Some of us measure our worship by the amount of goosebumps that pop up in our time of worship. How many goosebumps do you think How many goosebumps do you think Jesus felt when he was being beat within an inch of his life? Yet that was the greatest form of worship. The greatest sacrifice. The greatest act of submission. Ladies and gentlemen, the American idea of worship is not godly worship. We've gotten it wrong. And part of the problem and the reason why we've got it wrong is because we don't understand the duplicity of what's happened once we are made new and set free from this being a slave to sin. And the fact that we still have this flesh thing we're dealing with, although our mind has been renewed. And it rages war. What we know to be true, we don't feel to be true. And how many of you know that's a problem today? That's a problem. It affects our worship. It affects how we talk. It affects how we walk. It affects the choices we make. And we are constantly in in this difficult position of trying to not give way or sway to the flesh, but trust what we know. 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my Everybody say it out loud. Say it one more time. How do you serve the law of God? With your body? With your mind. How many of you know your body goes where your mind tells it to go? So we serve the Lord with our mind. We don't, we don't serve the Lord with our body because our body, one day we get a new body. Why do we get a new body? Because this body still got problems. It's got problems. Paul says that sin still rests in its members. We got a problem with our body. So this is a poignant description of someone who is in conflict with himself. I don't know if you can relate as a Christian. I don't know if you could relate as someone who's walked with the Lord any amount of time. As someone who loves God's moral law. Just think about that for a second. He describes himself as someone who loves God's law. How many non-believers do you know that love God's law? Something has to happen to renew your mind to love it. Someone who deep down in his innermost self wants to obey God's moral law. But then is pulled and pushed away from its fulfillment by sin. Sin, listen, that's in him. It is the personal experience of a soul in conflict. It's a battle. It is a warfare that rages in the hearts of men. And the conflict is real, and it is very intense, and it is very strong. Of that, there is no mistake. And all of us have felt this conflict if we are a true believer in Christ. If you have not felt this conflict, 1 John says, you might not be a believer. This conflict is real and only happens when we are His. It finds its summation in verse 25. Let's look look, look with me. Now, here's what you're going to have to do today. We're going to move through this quickly. I don't have time to stick around somewhere. So I'm going to give you chapters, books and chapters and verses I'm going to be circling around. And it will be your responsibility to get there quickly. And I'm going to read them. And I'm going to make points about them. And I'm going to bring clarification in some of the conflicting verses between chapter 6 and chapter 7. 
If you need to circle it, if you need to mark it, if you need to write it down, go back later and look at it. You do that. But today, I don't have time to labor and belabor uh, on a verse, but you have to. You're going to get lost if you don't follow along in your Bible. Everybody have your Bible? All right, so follow along with me. In verse 25 or verse 24. Oh, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Romans 7, 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. There is a wretched, in other words, there is a wretchedness about this battle. There is a wretchedness about this conflict. And then, and then the cry. He says this, who shall deliver me? And then, and then around these same verses, and then the affirmation. Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But even knowing that, that he then includes this at the very end. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Notice this, with my mind, everybody say mind. I serve the law of God. Everybody say law of God. With my flesh, everybody say flesh. I serve the law of sin. Say law of sin. You getting it? Making sense to you? You'll need that to make sense of chapter 7. You're going to need that. You're going to need to see that one is made holy and one is still unholy. One is new and completely righteous and completely pure and can never be a slave to sin and is completely filled and is God-like, Christ-like. That part of you looks like Christ. It's made holy. Holy, not just in in imputed righteousness, but in complete holiness. It's pure. That's new. That part of you can never be a slave to sin, but the flesh. But the flesh. That's what he's talking about. Now, some people say, regarding chapter 7, that Paul is describing a Christian. You might be getting a hint of what I feel regarding this, but we're going to talk about all of them. And some people say that this is a non-Christian. And then some people say the first part of it is a non-Christian, the second part of it is a Christian. Some people say that Paul is talking about back when, when he wasn't a Christian, and then he shifts and talks about when he is a Christian. Some people say that it's a Christian, but it's an immature Christian. Other people say it's a Christian, but it's a legalistic Christian. What's that? But I want to talk about three views today, because I think they're the three most common views. First, the non-Christian. In other words, one side says there's too much bondage to sin for this to possibly be a Christian. Paul uses terminology and words and vocabulary that makes us feel like there's too much bondage to sin. Especially coming out of chapter 6. How could we even talk like this, that there's so much bondage to sin? The vocabulary clearly tells us that this could not be a Christian. That's their position. The other side says there's too much desire for good and too much desire for the law of God for it to be a non-Christian. And so is Paul's writing. He torches all of us. It drives me crazy. But if we do the work, I think we can get to the answer. We can get there. How many of you are encouraged that we might be able to get there? Yes, good, me too. And therein is the conflict of interpreting chapter 7, specifically this portion of Scripture. Let's attempt to tackle this verse by verse. I have some, I have some images up here. You still need to mark it in your Bible. You still need to go home and do homework. You still, like, you're going to walk away going, da, 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 and you need to do some work. Because I've spent 30 hours on this, and I'm still going, I think I understand. All right? And this, you're getting it real fast. Let's tackle the non-Christian view for a second. Everybody say non-Christian. We're going to tackle the view that people interpret this as Paul is talking about a non-Christian here. Those who argue this is speaking of a non-Christian use several verses to build their case that 
Paul must be talking about a non-Christian here. Here they are. Um, I think you have them. Yeah, verse 14. Um, in verse 14 in chapter 7. In chapter 7. Let's look at the verses in chapter 7. The verses in chapter 7 they use to build their case that this must be a non-Christian that Paul's talking about. Verse 14. They use this. I am carnal, sold under sin. That bothers them. Especially coming off of verse chapter 6. I mean, you know, you're with me? And so they would say, this has to be an unbeliever. This could not be a believer. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform, perform that which is good I find not. In other words, they contend that this must be a non-Christian because a person who's a Christian knows how to do what's good. Or they ask, where's the evidence of the Holy Spirit in this kind of a statement? Where is He? He's not there? Where is He? And if He's not there, this must then be a non-Christian. Verse 24, O wretched man I am, He says. Seems rather far from the promise we see in Romans 5.1, which says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which grace which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. They further contend, how can he be carnal? Sold under sin when Romans 6.14 says this. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Seems pretty good. I might agree with them. This must be a non-Christian. Then they go on to chapter 6. Everybody say Romans chapter 6. Good, I'm just making sure you're with me. And then they invariably go to chapter 6 in detail and they give these verses as their case of saying that Paul must here in chapter 7 be talking about a non-Christian. Verse 2, how shall we that are dead or have died to sin live any longer in it? That's, that's, a, good, that's a good case verse for their position. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Another good case verse. Verse 7. How for he that has died is freed from sin. Verse 11. Reckon yourself to have died indeed unto sin. Verse 12. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Verse 17. God be thanked that whereas you were the servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You were delivered. You're delivered. Verse 18, being then made free from sin. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God. Seems like their case is strong. That Paul must then be talking about a non-Christian here. All these things we just read in chapter 6 become a stumbling block for seeing Romans 7, 14, which is the essential verse of this section. Some of you may be asking, Sean, why are we talking about these different positions? Because the positions affect the interpretation. And the wrong interpretation makes the illumination of the revelation lost on you. Then no longer are you benefactors of this word, but you are burdened by it through improper interpretation. That's pretty good. I wish I would have wrote that down because that would be a pretty good tweet, but I don't even know how that came together. Definitely not on my notes. But anyway, uh, maybe there's something bouncing around up in that cavernous space called a brain of mine yet. Right, so here we go. Chapter 6 becomes a stumbling block for seeing Romans 7.14, which says, I am carnal, sold under sin as a Christian. Are you beginning to understand the problem? 
It is my aim to deal with each of these as we work our way through this text. But as a general reference to Romans 6, let me break Romans 6 and Romans 7 down. Romans 6, the emphasis, and you write this down as best you can, because this will help you. The emphasis in, is, in, in Romans 6 is on the new creation, the new nature. I'm using key words here. New nature, new identity, new person in Christ. The emphasis, therefore, is on the holiness of the believer. The emphasis in 7 does not necessarily have to be the same as chapter 6. So, Romans 6, the, the emphasis, every position and Christian knows, every Christian knows that even though he is a new in Christ and sin's dominion is broke and sin is no longer have mastery over him, sin is still a problem. Every Christian knows this. And so, whether or not you want to see chapter 7 as him talking about a non-Christian or a Christian, you've still got to see a Christian having conflict with sin, even though his new creation, his new self, is holy. It's a problem. It's a problem. Now, Paul's. Pause, because we can get into some dangerous territory here. Let me, let, me, let me give you a cause for pause and a, and a word of caution here. You do not take human experience and make that Lord and then interpret Bible based on what you've experienced. Because that'll get you lost real quick. Because, because your human experience is based on flesh. And what are we hearing about the flesh? It's broken. And so if you trust the flesh to interpret the Bible, you start wrong before you even begin. So although we can reflect and understand that sin is still a problem, listen, it's not just in Romans 7 that we hear that sin is still an issue for Christians. It is the New Testament and specifically the epistles are replete with, with conversation about a Christian life and the conflict that remains Replete. It's full. Complete. Fully saturated with this kind of language. So here's the conflict. Romans 6 reveals the new creation, the new self that is holy. Romans 7 reveals a conflict that wages war against the new creation. The conflict is not only seen in chapter 7, but listen, here, here this is important. As we, as we try to look at the verses they're using to say this is a non-Christian, right? Because we have to know whether it's a non-Christian or Christian to be able to interpret it. And our interpretation is going to be built off of how we view this. right? So it starts there. So we got to get that right. But although there's many verses in chapter 6 that, that, they, that people build a case that it must be a non-Christian, what are they to do with, chapter, with verse 12? Look at it, Romans 6, 12. What are they going to do with that? Here's a conflict that exists even in the midst, the middle of all of their case verses for their defense. Here's a conflict. It's a conflict that's there, that they have to deal with it. Romans 6.12 says this, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That means it can? Wait a minute. I thought sin was dead. I thought we were dead to sin. I, so it can reign in your mortal body? Notice where it assigns it. Not to your renewed mind. It assigns it to Where? Notice this. And you gotta, you got to listen to these divisions. you got to listen to where he applies, where the new man is, and where he applies, where the old nature is. you got to listen to this. you got to hear this because he's assigning it to this terminology. The conflict is in these things. So although the new man, the renewed mind, the new man, the new man, we are made new, is set free from sin, dead to sin, Holy, not a slave to sin, but a slave to righteousness. Although we have that, we have 
in this same person a body which is still broken and still has sin. And as a matter of fact, we can still give this body over to. That's why he then commands us in Romans 6, 12, let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You mean you can? If you're made new? How is it that Romans 6 says things like this? And they have a slide. I think. Oh, you did really good. It's the next slide, though. Yeah, there you go. Romans 6 says things like this. <laughs> good, I said died. I read it just now. We dead to sin. And it's that too. We dead to sin. <laughs> That's the way I read it, but I wrote it the right way, so I'm really thankful for that, right? That's what happens when you're a skim a reader. We died to sin. Another thing that Romans 6 says, if we are dead to sin, how can we live any longer in it? The body of sin was destroyed and we do not serve sin. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. You are set free from sin and now a slave to God. But what are we to do with Romans 6.12, which I just mentioned, which commands us to not let sin reign? Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot accept all the other verses and not come to the, conclusion, the conclusionary verse of Romans 6.12, which speaks that although we're set free, we still are in bondage to this other part of us in the flesh. This presents a problem in chapter 6 for those who hold the position that Romans 7 is talking about non-Christians. And it's a massive problem for them. It's a massive problem for them. And all that Paul said in chapter 6 about our new nature, our new creation, our new essence, he never states, listen to this, you write this down, he never states, he never promises, he never, he never inclines us to believe that we would not battle sin. Not once does he say that. We come to that conclusion on our own. As a matter of fact, verse 12 clearly implies that sin could still have a reigning place in us. It could still be shouting out orders that we are submitting to. We could still be obeying sin. Notice what we take captive and then make it obedient to Christ. And notice where we do it. It's important. Maybe the pieces will begin to come together for you. It could still be shouting out orders that we are submitting to. We could still be obeying sin. Look at verse 13. This is crazy. Look at verse 13. Do not then present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, which is to say you are capable of doing just that. There is a a capability of accomplishing that. So if your interpretation for chapter 7 is that this must be a non-Christian because Christians cannot do that, they're disagreeing with the conclusion of chapter 6 by the Apostle Paul, who says Christians most certainly can do that. Are you with me? So we can see that the same problem we have in chapter 7, we also have in chapter 6. Look at 6.19. I am speaking, and I love this, 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 we broached this subject in our groups. I love it. He's like, he's like he has this stop moment in the middle of his talk, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm speaking in human terms because I don't even know the words that I can choose to try to explain what happens for a believer. Not, not only do I not know the words in human terms to give you, but you got a human flesh that's causing you to interpret this probably different than what I really mean it. So so not only am I trying to interpret and and communicate something by the Spirit through the flesh, it's being interpreted through the flesh, and we got a double negative, hoping that you'll get it. Right? It's crazy. Because we know that our flesh is still broken. Isn't it crazy that God uses a vessel, the flesh, it's broken, to communicate the gospel. And we hear... 
the gospel through a vessel that's broken. You know why he does that? So only he gets the glory when illumination happens, when the gospel is preached. Not the man who preaches it. Can he get the glory? Absolutely not. Because he has flesh. And how could a man wrapped in flesh, broken with the old nature, communicate anything that is glorious from God? And how can a man who's sitting listening to a man who's preaching from the flesh and they are in the flesh hear anything glorious from God? Because God is God all by himself. And he will let and illuminate and give the gospel and reveal the gospel to who he pleases in spite of who preaches and those who listen to who preach. That's good stuff. God gets the glory. He always gets the glory. That's why we're here today. See, ladies and gentlemen, you might have thought you came here to celebrate Mother's Day. But mothers, we didn't come here today to celebrate you. We came here to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and it is He that we worship. That's who we worship. Happy Mother's Day, though. Oh, man, I'm glad you're still here at church. Does an unbeliever delight in the law of God after the inward man? You won't find such an indication in the Scripture. Listen to this. Verse 22, for I delight in the law. Listen, listen. Where, where am I at? Well, let's go back. I'm speaking human terms. We got, we're there. When you sin, it isn't the new you What is it? It's your flesh, your humanness. And so he says, he goes on, I'm speaking human terms. It's the flesh that does it. It's the broken part of you. And then he goes on, he completes this verse. I have to remind you of these things because your flesh is still there. For as you have yielded your member servants to uncleanliness and iniquity unto iniquity in the past, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. So arguing that chapter 7 cannot refer to a Christian because of statements in chapter 6 is to really misunderstand the intention of chapter 6. We miss it. And I think it to be a rather weak argument, period. Now let's move on. This is what I believe. And I align with the idea of a Christian view. We just looked that Paul must be talking about a non-Christian. I hold the position that Paul is talking about a Christian. Now let's look at Romans 7, 14 through 25. Now we're not going to read it all, but I'm going to pull out and extrapolate specific verses that are pertinent for this position. And let's look at it as if it were a Christian. As if it were a Christian in view. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? That's a very strong statement, isn't it? I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Question. Does an unbeliever delight in the law of God after an inward man? You won't find such an indication anywhere in Scripture. It isn't in there. In fact, in Romans 8, 7, I know we're not there yet. This is cheating. In Romans 8, 7, the middle of the verse, it says that the unregenerated person is not subject to the law of God. Let's let's read it. Let's read Romans 8, 7 in two different translations. It's going to seem crazy. King James first. I kind of like the way that it says it. It kind of puts it in a little interesting way. And then... ESV, King James first. Because the carnal mind, everybody say mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Notice, it's the carnal mind. Is that enmity against God? This is, of course, speaking of a non-believer. How could a carnal mind, a non-believer, be subject to the law... At all. Romans 8, 7 and the ESV. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. I like that. 
It cannot. It speaks of completeness. Yet here we read Paul say, I delight in the law of God. And then we're man. I think it's speaking about a Christian here. Look at verse 25. I thank God (laughs) through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a strong case just right there. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Remember, we just heard you cannot if you're an unbeliever. Case and point. Conclusion. That's my ending statement as a lawyer. And I walk off, drop the mic, say, who's your daddy, under my breath. Right? That's what it is. Sounds like a Christian for two reasons. Let me give you those two reasons. One, he thanks God through the Lord, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> two, he serves the law of God with his mind. An unbeliever has a carnal mind, not a renewed one. And only a renewed one can serve the law. That's the facts. That's facts. Read your Bible. It's facts. It's all over. I remind you of what it says in chapter 8, again, that the one who is apart from Christ cannot be subject to the law of God. Look at Romans 7.15. Romans 7.15 says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. To me, that says that there is a battle here. Because the deepest, truest part of this individual wants to do what is right. But something keeps him from doing it. Is this true of an unsaved person? That they long to do what is right, but are inexplicably prevented from doing it constantly? Look at Romans 7.18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is, in my flesh. He Listen, it's like he knows... That he better clarify, and he clarifies with the terms I talked to you about earlier. He gives a clarification because I don't want them to think all of me, just that part of me that prevents me, that comes in conflict, that wages war against me. Not the whole me, but the me that is the new me. The me that is the old me is the one that's causing the problem. But I identify with the new me. Because one day he takes the old me and he gives me the complete new me by giving me a new body. That's good stuff, right? He clarifies. What does he clarify? Because I I forgot where I'm at. He says, uh, what was I? Was it 18? For I know there's no me. Okay, yeah. For I know nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. He clarifies it. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Why can't he carry it out? Something is coming against him. Again, it's the same idea. Something deep inside me wants to do what's right, but there's conflict. You have it in verse 19. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. You have it in verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. So the heart, the soul, the mind, deep within the individual, longs to do what is good. The bent is towards good. When was the last time you heard of a non-believer being good in nature? The Bible says there's nothing good in men. The Bible says of our hearts, it is infinitely wicked. We cannot trust it. Until we're made new. Until we're made new. There's an evil principle that causes it to be not so easily accomplished. Whoever this is, get this, he longs to do good things and finds himself doing what? Bad things. Furthermore, let us not too quickly forget Romans chapter 3. Because if you forget where we were before, this won't make sense either. Romans 3.10 says, there is none good. No, no, not one. For all you New Agers who love Facebook posts that sound Christian, but they're not. Well, they have a good heart. No, they don't. 
Only God is good. You know that scripture? It sounds cool. But we've gotten into this difficulty, this problem of wanting to encourage people with lies, and we call it Christianity. That's harsh, wasn't it? But it's true. Sounds good, but it's a lie. Let me tell you what lies will do, lead you astray. And some of you would rather go to bed with a lie and serve eternity in hell because you have temporary pleasure than be told the truth and be inconvenienced temporarily and live with him eternally. Are you with me? It's true. Think about it. It's true. There's no one good. He says everything about them is bad. Everything. Romans 3.11 says no one understands. No one seeks God. Nobody seeks God's purposes. No one wants to do His will. And no one loves His holy moral law. No one. No one. Romans 3.18 says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. They have no regard for Him. They don't care about Him. And they don't love Him. And matter of fact, they know what He wants. They do the opposite anyway. And they encourage others to rebel against Him. That's what it says of them. Lost non-believers. So ladies and gentlemen, this cannot be a non-believer. Paul's talking about The conflict here, the tension, the battle between what Paul says, I delight in, I love, I approve, I want, I long to do, and that he actually does, I believe, can only be true in a redeemed person. There's another position, last and final position. Immature Christian view. Some people say it's a description of a Christian on a low, low level of of spirituality. I mean, this guy... Hasn't even figured out what's going on yet. He's so new to Christ, he's tossed to and fro by the waves because he's immature. See, when God accomplishes something, he accomplishes it. He's trying in his own strength when he really needs to just trust God. He's still trying to live according to the flesh, but he's not trusting in his spiritual man. One day he'll be mature enough and this won't be a problem for him. One commentary writer actually says... This is the abject misery of failure of a Christian who attempts to please God under the Mosaic system. Mosaic system. Sort of a super legalistic kind of Christian. Just pause here for a second. Just, just, just. I'm not trying to hate on people smarter than me. But just pause here for a second. Right? Just pause. Legalistic Christian? You, you mean pharmaceutical. You mean people who hope to be justified by following the law. They're believers now? You with me? You're either saved by grace or you're not. How many of you know that if you hope to be saved by the law, you have to fulfill the law in every portion of the law. And if you break it in one part, you break it in all parts, and you're going to hell. And there is no one, nowhere, no way that has not broke one part, except for Jesus Christ our Lord. He, could, he, could, he kept it in every part. He died. He bled for us. He resurrected from the grave that we might be buried into a death that is fully righteous, that fully obeyed, that through Him, although we broke the law in many parts, we are baptized into a man who did not break it in any part. And that is transferred through us through justification by faith. That's good stuff. Yet, this writer is saying, This must be an immature Christian who's super legalistic but still a Christian trying to crank out his own righteousness and he's unable to do it in his own flesh. I would say that kind of person calls himself a Christian but is not a Christian. I don't believe there is such a thing as a legalistic Christian. But let's just say for a moment, for sake of argument, that there would be such a thing as a legalistic Christian. A legalistic Christian would never have this type of perspective. A perspective of a struggle. 
A perspective that they want to do good, but they always do the dumb thing. I don't know if you've ever made any legalistic Christians, but the legalistic Christians that I might consider would be people who think they're righteous in all things. And everyone else has got a problem. You with me? They live under the illusion that they are very, very spiritual. They would never for a minute think that they struggle in the slightest and they would see themselves as perfect. So this position that people have, this must be immature Christian who's legalistic but eventually one day will break out of that, is ridiculous. You want to know what kind of Christian this is? My friend, this is the most... You want to know what kind of Christian I believe this is Paul's talking about? This is the most mature spiritual Christian that could ever be. Not immature. This this defines a person who was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. Who no longer is. This is the most spiritual Christian ever could be who sees so clearly the inability of his flesh as over against the holiness of God's divine standard. And the more mature he is, the more spiritual he is. The greater will be the sensitivity of his own shortcomings. You show me an infantile, carnal, fleshly, legalistic, self-righteous kind of Christian. And I'll show you somebody who lives under the delusion that everything he's doing is very spiritual when in all actuality it's not spiritual at all. It's selfish. You show me a person with this kind of brokenness You show me a person agonizing in the depths of his own soul because he can't do anything written in the law of God. And I'll show you a very spiritual person. I believe what you have here is Paul. That's right, Paul. And you see the word I 46 times in this small portion of Scripture, Romans 7. I think it's Paul. I think it's Paul. I think he's talking about Paul. And I think he's talking because he thinks he's a Christian. Here's another, here's other books of the Bible that Paul says something similar. First Corinthians. I'm, 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 I'm out of time. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Almost done though. First Corinthians 15, 9. He says the same thing in other terms. He says this. For I am the least of the apostles. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. You see that? He didn't say I wasn't fit to be an apostle. He said, what? I am not fit now to be an apostle. I'm the least of all. That's the heart of a very mature Christian. Ephesians 3.8, he says, unto me, he says, who am less than the least. As he views himself against the holy law of God, he in his own mind is less than the least of all the saints. It's Paul. It's Paul. In 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me in that he counted me faithful. Putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. You say, well, sure, that's what he was, Sean. Well, let's read on. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly, abundantly, with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners 
of whom I, what? Was the chief? Am chief. Nevertheless, for this cause, I obtain mercy. Is this the voice of an immature believer? No. This is the voice of a very mature believer in Christ. Listen, I think that's exactly what he's saying in Romans 7. This is Paul far along in his apostleship. Mature in the Lord, walking in the dynamic of spiritual life, having experienced the mighty power of God and the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. And the more he knows, the more he experiences and the more he hates the sin that he sees hanging on. And the terms that he uses in Romans 7 are so precise that I think we cannot miss the picture here. To get this wrong is to miss the whole point. 